In this video, I will discuss how to create presentation and e-learning videos without using special software or equipment. This video was created using this method and all the techniques described will be demonstrated. This is a long video, but you don't need to watch it all in one sitting. The next slide contains a table of contents to help you navigate to a particular section if you want to watch it again. This is the table of contents for this video. The start time of each section is listed on the left to help you quickly fast forward to the part you want to watch. Watch at least the first three sections to learn the basics of creating e-learning videos. If your goal is just to record demonstration videos, the video section is all you need to watch. It may surprise you, but PowerPoint provides all the functionality that you need to produce e-learning videos. This is done by recording your voice presentation and slide timings over a PowerPoint slideshow. The recorded slideshow can then be exported as an MP4 video. Any PowerPoint presentation you've ever created can be turned into a slideshow and exported as a video. You don't need to be a PowerPoint expert. You just need some basic slides, but there are lots of other things that can be done to make the presentation more interesting, such as the use of video. The basics will be shown first before covering other techniques that may be useful. This video is all about PowerPoint, but it's not going to show you every detail. The goal is to show you what you need to know to produce simple videos and demonstrate some more complicated techniques. For more information on using PowerPoint, check out the many e-learning opportunities provided at MoLearning or search for PowerPoint videos on YouTube. It's easy to go overboard on animations and transitions like I have in this video. Also use some judgment to determine what level of effort should be spent developing e-learning for different topics. Some topics are well suited for simple videos, while others may justify more effort because of the subject matter or the size of the audience. Development of training resources is an investment, but comes at a cost of time and effort. There are four steps to produce an e-learning video. Step one, prepare your content. Step two, create a PowerPoint presentation. Step three, record the slideshow. And step four, export the video. The first part of this video will cover each of these steps. You are watching this video, so you are probably a subject matter expert. In preparation for creating your video, you need a topic to present that is very well defined. You already have the software you'll need to produce e-learning videos. PowerPoint is part of Microsoft Office, and you'll also need the Snip and Sketch tool or the Snipping tool that come with Windows 10. You can produce your PowerPoint on any computer, but when you're ready to record, you'll want a computer with at least two monitors and a microphone. A laptop is best because the microphone is built in. Before you're ready to make an e-learning video, you'll want to create a detailed outline of what you're going to cover. Most people will benefit from preparing some presentation notes or maybe even a full script of what they want to say. The audio is recorded into each slide, so having a prepared script makes production of video very easy. You will also want to collect or produce any images, screenshots, or videos that you might want to include. The second step is creating the PowerPoint presentation. The process of building a PowerPoint presentation will be broken down into sub-steps as we continue, and almost all of them are optional and can be performed in any order. Step one, create a new presentation file. Step two, add slides and type in the bullet points. Step three, add bullet transitions so the bullet points appear one at a time. Step four, add optional slide transitions. Step five, add images or videos or animations. The PowerPoint presentation used to produce this video is available to download as an example. The best approach is to start simple and add features incrementally until you achieve the effect you want. Remember to utilize online learning opportunities for PowerPoint and refer to the example presentation. I recommend working on a local copy of your presentation for good performance. If you use images and video, the presentation will become large and saving to the network will be slow. 
Remember that files saved on your computer are not backed up. Always copy your presentation folder to the network or SharePoint after you are finished working on it for the day. First, create a folder on your laptop and name it with the training or presentation name. Then you will create a PowerPoint presentation. After the new blank presentation is open, go ahead and save it using the same name as the folder. Now I'll demo creating the PowerPoint file. First, I'll create a folder on my computer to hold the PowerPoint file and any other files I may use. I'll name the folder with the presentation name. Now I'll start PowerPoint and select New to create a new PowerPoint file. You can select a theme if you want to use one, or you can use the blank theme. Now that my blank presentation is open, I'll save it. I'll navigate to the folder I just created. I'll type in a name for the presentation and save it. Next, create all of your slides that you'll need in your presentation according to your detailed outline. On each slide, type the bullet points that you want to talk about. Also consider closed captions. They appear in the lower center area of the slide, so it's best to avoid placing critical information in this area. Now I'll demo adding a slide and typing some bullets. Now I'll demonstrate how to create all the presentation slides. First, I'm going to type in the name of the presentation on the title slide. Now we'll create the first slide from the course outline. Right click on slide number one thumbnail, which is the title slide, and choose new slide. Select the blank slide you just created and type in the heading for the slide. Then start typing the bullet points into the body of the slide. When you press enter, a new bullet will be created. You can also paste bullets from your outline to save some typing. Repeat this process for every slide in your presentation. Images are important in presentations and can come from many different sources and can be inserted into any slide. Photos often need to be edited. The most often used editing functions are cropping and resizing. iPhones have good photo editing capability on the phone, but photos can also be easily edited in PowerPoint. Image editing will be demonstrated in the extra section of this video. As part of the preparation, you should already have your images and screen captures. Screen captures can be made using Snap and Sketch tool or the Snipping tool. Now I'll demonstrate inserting images. Photos and images can be inserted using the Photos function under Insert in the ribbon menu. You can insert images like I'm showing here by dragging them. There are many formatting functions for images such as cropping, resizing, and rotating that are available. Here I'm showing how to add a border to the selected image. It is often desirable to reveal the bullet points one at a time as they are being discussed in the presentation. The functions to do this are provided under the Animations tab. To accomplish this, you select the bullet points and add animations so that the bullets fade in as you advance to presentation. Once animations are created, each mouse click or enter press will reveal one bullet until all the bullets are displayed. Now I'm going to demonstrate adding animations. First, let's open the animation pane under the animations tab. The animation pane holds all the setup for animation on this slide. 
Animations are assigned to objects, and the objects that we're going to be using are the bullets in the slide. We're going to add the fade in option to these bullets. So the first thing I'll do is select all the bullets, and then I'll go up to Add Animation and select the animation type that I want to add. There are um, several different types of animations. The green ones are entrance animations, so all of those will make an object appear. The emphasis animations will cause uh, attention to be uh, moved to that object, so something like spinning or color, color pulse or something like that, grow shrink. The red uh, animations are exit animations, and they'll make an object disappear. And then at the uh, bottom are some motion path animations. But for these bullets, we're going to use fade, and we want them to fade in. So we're going to use the green fade animation type. So we'll select it. And when we select, they will all be added on the right side. And um, you'll see that there's a, a mouse by the first one, and that indicates that that animation will activate on mouse click. And if I right click on there, on the first animation, you'll see that uh, the first one with the mouse icon is start on click. There's also start with previous and start after previous. And the um, additional animations in this list are all uh, activated with start with previous. So that means that when you click for the first animation, the next three will happen immediately after that click. Well, that's not really what we want. We want them all to be uh, activated by mouse click. So we'll have to set them all. They're all selected now. So if I choose start on click, they would all change to start on click. But I'm going to click away so that they're deselected and I can show that these can be set individually as you go through the list. So they're now all set to uh, fade in on click. Uh, another thing you can do here is you can grab these and change the order, and that's necessary. Uh, for instance, if you are uh, editing your bullets and you change the order of bullets, you'll have to change the order of the uh, animations to follow the correct order. You can also remove these uh, by right-clicking and removing them and then that animation would, would no longer occur. So that's the basics of adding a simple fade-in animation. Now enter your slide notes or a complete word-for-word -word script in the notes pane at the bottom of your slide. If this pane is not open, you can drag it open with your mouse to the size you want. You may notice in this slide, I have the words click entered where I want to advance to the next bullet. It's helpful to provide prompts like this in your notes to remind you to advance the slide at the correct time. Transitions are easy to apply and can be added between slides to smooth out the change from slide to slide if desired. This video uses fade transitions between every slide. To do this, select any slide thumbnail. Select the Transitions menu, then click the transition type you want to apply to the slide. Fade is a good choice because it's subtle and smooth. Then select Apply to All to apply the transition to all slides. After you start recording your slides later on in the process, make sure you never apply transitions to all slides. Applying transitions to all slides that have been recorded will mess up your slide durations. Transitions between slides can also be used for effect and can be used to indicate change between sections. Here is a demonstration of that application. I'm guessing the origami transition probably isn't used a lot. Anyway, when you reach step three, the PowerPoint presentation is complete, and now you're ready to record the slideshow. There are a few things to set up first. You'll need a computer with two monitors and a microphone. A laptop is a good choice. Also, set up where you're close to the laptop microphone and test your audio. Being too far away will degrade the sound quality. Find a quiet room with good acoustics for recording. Small rooms with low ceilings are usually better than large ones. Rooms with lots of hard surfaces such as concrete or tile are worse. Rooms with more sound deadening materials such as carpet are better. You'll also want to review your outline or script. 
Now you're ready to record your presentation. When you record a slideshow, you will work one slide at a time. The slideshow will record your voice and all the slide timing as you present. You will be able to read from your notes while presenting, but unlike a regular presentation, PowerPoint does not display the presenter notes well when recording. There is a workaround for this that I'll demonstrate in a minute. You can record each slide multiple times. If you mess up, no big deal, just record it again. It's also easy to update the slide at a later date if you need to. This is a little tricky to set up at first, but works well if you follow the steps. You can also activate the laptop camera if you want to include a video thumbnail of yourself as you present. Here's how you set up to record, but first I should explain that we are only recording the voice track and the timings. The video isn't created until the very end. This means that you can make edits to the slides after you record it that don't involve screen timings. This is handy if you find a typo or want to make additions or changes that don't mess up your recorded timings. So first, start PowerPoint and move the application window to your secondary monitor. Then select Record Slideshow from the Slideshow ribbon, which opens up the recording window set to the current slide. Now your current slide should be open in full screen presentation view. Your current slide should be open in full screen presentation view on your laptop monitor and the recording panel should be open on the secondary monitor like this. If this isn't the correct slide, you can press the arrow buttons. The only problem is that the speaker notes are not provided where they can be easily read by the presenter. To fix this, we can just read the notes out of the PowerPoint slide editing window. To do this, resize the recording window to as narrow as you can get it, which is about half size. Then fit the PowerPoint window to fit the other half. Now I'll demonstrate how to set up the secondary monitor so that you can read your notes while recording. So here we are looking at the secondary monitor. I'll press the record slideshow button. The presentation will be shown in full screen on the laptop monitor and the recording window will be shown on the secondary monitor as you see here. Now make room for your notes. So let's make the recording window smaller so that it only takes up about half the width of the screen on the left and move the PowerPoint application to the right side of the screen and resize it to fit the space available. Finally, resize your notes area so that you can see all your notes. With a little practice, this is easy to do and provides the ability to read all your notes while recording. This is how the setup looks when you're ready to record. Your slide and presentation view is on the laptop monitor and the recording panel is on the left half of the secondary monitor. The speaker notes are on the right side of the secondary monitor in the PowerPoint slide editing window. There are three icons in the bottom right of the recording panel. Make sure the microphone is turned on, which is indicated by no line through the icon. To record the slide, press the record button. A countdown of three, two, one, will occur and then you'll be recording your voice and slide timings. I usually advance the slides using the right arrow on the keyboard because it's quieter than mouse clicks. After your presentation for a slide is over, it's a good idea to leave one or two seconds of dead air before you end it. Stopping the recording too soon may cause an abrupt finish. End the recording with a stop button when you are finished. You can press the replay button to see how you did and if you want to re-record, you can press the record button and try again. Once you are happy with the recording, you can use the left and right arrow buttons to go to the next slide you want to record. Just remember to change your slide notes to the current slide. Repeat these steps for every slide in the presentation. If you play your PowerPoint slides after you record them, it will run on autopilot and use your timings and recorded narration because of these settings in the slideshow menu. If you want to use the presentation without the recordings, just deselect the play narrations and use timing options. When you reach step four, your recording work is complete. And if you play your slideshow, it will play all the way through. It's time to create the video file. Under the file menu is the export function. Select create a video. Use the full HD option and select the Use Recorded Timings and Narration option. 
Press the export button and save the file in your presentation folder with the presentation name. It will have an MP4 extension. The status bar will display at the bottom of the screen showing progress. This can take a while if the presentation is big. As far as output quality is concerned, the HD720P option is sufficient for most applications and will create a much smaller file than the full HD1080P option. That's it. You're finished creating a video. Don't forget to copy all your files to a network, share, or to SharePoint for backup. The PowerPoint presentation can be reused for future updates, so don't lose it. That's all the information you need to produce a basic e-learning video, but this video is not over. Go make a video now or keep watching to see more. I'm glad that you are still watching. The rest of the video is composed of extra sections that build on the first part. See the table of contents at the beginning of the video for a complete listing of extra credit topics. A screen capture is an image of what is seen on a computer screen at a given time. The ability to create them is important when creating e-learning videos. There are a couple of tools provided with Windows 10 for taking screen captures. The snipping tool shown in the upper right is one and it is being replaced with Snip and Sketch on the lower left. You can find Snip and Sketch in your start menu. In Snip and Sketch, when you select the Snip Now command, you can draw a box for a screen grab. Rectangular capture is the default, but options are available at the top of your screen to select freeform or full screen. The snip in three or 10 second option allows you to get right click menus or other dynamic behaviors ready, and then the program freezes all of your screens so that you can select the area to snip. Here's a demo of snip and sketch. All right, now let's demo the snip and sketch tool and we'll start it in the start menu. The snip now will use a default rectangular snip. So you drag the area you would like from the screen, it shows up in a little window and you have some markup options which aren't typically used, but there's several available with different colors and different settings. There's also a delete tool, uh, an eraser, uh, which will allow you to delete this if you make a mistake. The next tool is the crop tool. Uh, you can crop here uh, to change the, the size or you can, uh, of course, crop in PowerPoint. The little disk icon will allow you to save it to disk and then the Next uh, icon will copy it to your clipboard to have it available, which is the most important function. The snip in three or 10 seconds will give you three seconds to get a dynamic menu the way you want it. And then the screen will freeze. Actually, all your monitors freeze if you have more than one. And then you can snip that item and um, use it as you'd like. I quickly mentioned images in the first part of the video. PowerPoint contains many editing functions. Here are some of the important ones that I'll demonstrate. Now I'd like to demonstrate some image editing uh, functions in PowerPoint. Uh, as you can see here, I have a slide with uh, a couple of images in it and I want to uh, demonstrate resize, stretch, and rotate. To resize an image, uh, you just merely select it and some grips appear on, uh, around the perimeter and uh, just grab one of the corner grips and drag it and you'll get a scaled resize, which is real nice. If you select one of the middle left or top and bottom uh, grips or the right, uh, you'll get a stretch, which on an image will distort it. And that may be something that you want. Uh, rotating is easy. Uh, there's a grip uh, rotating grip at the top when you select an item and you just drag it and you can simply rotate to the level that you want. Now I'll demonstrate bring to front and send to back. Each uh, image or object in PowerPoint is created at a different layer and if I uh, drag the Bob image over you'll see that it's actually behind the other image and each uh, object is at a different, um, different depth. 
So I'd like to move that to the front and to do that, I can uh, change it in the format menu. The format menu is up uh, in the ribbon under the format uh, label, or I can double click my image and it will make it active. And up here I have uh, bring forward and send backward, which would be sending at one level because everything is at a different level. You can have uh, different items uh, overlapping uh, other items. Uh, underneath this menu is also uh, bring to front and send it back, which will send it all the way to the front or the back, no matter how many objects there are. These functions can also be uh, conveniently accessed by right-clicking the image. And um, the same functions are available in this case. I'm going to bring the image to the front. And now when I drag it over, it will be in front of the other image the way I want. Now I'll demonstrate the crop tool. The crop tool is used to uh, resize an image in a way that you can eliminate part of the image uh, that you don't need. So, uh, for example, in this image on the right side, we can eliminate part of the sky. To um, start the crop command, you go to the Format tab or double-click on your image. And uh, if the image is selected, uh, you select the crop tool and these uh, dark black grips show up and you can grab those grips and move those and eliminate the parts of the photo that you do not need. And once completed, just click away and it will reset and those parts will be gone. Then you can use your image in any way you want, resize it or whatever. Uh, the nice thing about the crop tool is that uh, the cropping is not permanent. So if you want to adjust it, you can go back to the crop tool and resize using these grips to whichever size you want and you can also um, grab the image and move it around with within the crop tool which is another way of, of adjusting okay i've zoomed in about 200 percent here to demonstrate the remove background tool if you take a look at Barrel Bob here and I drag him over this other image, you can see that uh, this image has a white background and I'd like to remove that, that background. This is a really good image for removing the background because the background is all white and it's really well defined. And this image I know will be easy to remove the background on. Some images are not so easy and you'll have to do some uh, work to get the image to be removed and some images won't work at all. So you just have to give it a try. Uh, the Remove Background tool is up in the Format menu again, so I'm going to double-click my image. It's up here on the left. and When I select the Remove Background tool, it gives it a first automatic try at removing the background, and the magenta areas are all the areas that will be removed. And if I uh, click Keep Changes on that, then you'll see that it removed a lot of the background, but it also removed uh, Barrel Bob's uh, hard hat and part of this uh, lower barrel on the left. So I'm going to go back to the remove background tool and you have a couple of options up here to mark areas to keep or mark areas to remove. Um, in this area or in this case I have some areas that I want to keep so I can select that tool and I can come up and just draw a little bit in them in the areas and it will add them back. This area down here I can do the same might take me a couple of attempts to get all the parts that I want and then I'm good to go. This is an easy image. Most images aren't quite this easy. Then when I hit accept, um, I'm fairly happy with that. And now when I move it over to be uh, in front of something else, I have a transparent background. Now I'd like to demonstrate the group and align tools. Group tool is used to take objects on your slide and group them together so that they can be used as a single item. So I've taken our barrel bob from the uh, last example and I've added some juggling balls to it. And these are all separate, as you can see. And if I wanted to move this around, I would have to make a selection set every time and carefully move them and not uh, mess up their um, orientation with each other. I can group those together. So I can either uh, drag a selection set like this or hold down the shift button and select them. And once they are all picked, I can right click or I can also uh, access, up, access this up in the format menu 
uh, select group. And once you select group, it combines all those items into one object, which I can then move around very easily. And I can also um, resize it and scale it as well. Now you'll notice here in this um, instance, when I grab the corner grip, it will go every which direction. Um, I'll need to hold the shift button down to force that to stay as a scaling resize. So once all those are together, they will be one object. I can also break them back apart by doing a right click and going up to the group function and selecting ungroup and that would ungroup them. Uh, to demonstrate a line, I'm going to resize barrel bob a little smaller and create several of these and throw them out here. And demonstrate uh, aligning them. Let's say I wanted those all in a horizontal line. I would uh, need to select them all. Whoops. I need to select them all. I'll hold down my shift and select them all. And once they're all selected, up in the uh, format menu, there is the align uh, group. And when it's opened, I have all sorts of horizontal and, and vertical ways to align these. And I'm going to use uh, align bottom in the horizontal direction. And when I do that, it aligns them very nicely. There's also a command under here, among others, to uh, distribute horizontally. And if that is selected, it will make an even spacing, which is very useful. Now let's discuss format picture. Format picture is a way of uh, adjusting the settings of any pictures or images that you have on your slides. Uh, to access this function, uh, you'll just select an image and right click on it and select the format picture option. You'll see this barrel bob has no border or any special options added to it. So I'm going to select it, right click and select format picture. The um, settings will come up on the right side of, of your screen and there's several sections across the top and these will act on whichever uh, picture is selected. And we'll start on the left with the uh, bucket of paint and there's two options in that, fill and a line. The line indicates the borderline around the outside and the default is no line, but if I select solid line, you'll see that uh, I have a color set and a wide width of 7.25 points. And um, those are the two settings you'll use the most, but you can choose uh, other settings to get a different look with different line styles or different line types. You can um, also pick from many colors um, and change the width of the border very easily. The fill section is the background fill of the uh, image. Default is no fill, but you can select solid fill and get a, a solid color. Um, any of these colors, I'll pick a primary color that's dark. Uh, you can change the transparency so that you can see through the background, um, which can be useful. Um, also offers a gradient fill with many settings. You can also pick a uh, texture fill, which um, there's several of those to choose from. Um, and there's also pattern fills. You can select different patterns, different colors, lots of options. Now moving to the right, uh, there's an effect section, which um, will um, provide more options. Um, and I, I don't use this uh, section uh, very often, but it is available. The next is size and properties. Um, don't use this very much either, but it's um, there and useful for fine settings. The last one is the picture settings, and there are several sections I'll collapse so you can see them all. Um, there's a lot of crop settings in here you can do for fine tuning. Um, I usually use the crop tool. Uh, picture transparency is probably the most useful. You uh, come in here after you select your image and drag the transparency tool and you can uh, now see that the barrel bob images are in the background. 
uh, there are picture color and picture uh, corrections that you can use to change the look uh, of your images, which might be useful to you. Let's discuss shapes. Shapes are created under the Insert menu. The most useful shapes are lines, rectangles, circles, and arrows, but there are many more. Shapes can be used with all the formatting tools that we've discussed, such as Bring Forward and Back, Group, and Align. If a place shape is selected, a format shape window is available and contains many of the same properties that format images uses. Videos are an important resource that can be inserted into your presentations. Video can come from many sources and most popular video formats are supported. Digital camcorders shoot excellent video, but iPhones are also a good and convenient device for capturing video. Like photos, videos can be edited on the iPhone or in PowerPoint. Instructional video can be recorded successfully on department iPhones. First of all, shoot wide unless there is a special purpose. Most of the rules for video are the same as for photography. Try for even lighting. When it comes to outdoor photography, early morning and late evening when the sun is low on the sky and shines with a warm color is the best. Overcast days can also be good. Avoid the midday harsh sunlight. If even lighting can't be achieved, a light source or the sun behind the photographer is better than backlighting the subject. Shoot steady. Don't shoot video at arm length. This is a poor technique and produces shaky video that is hard to watch. You might get a result like this. Instead, use an inexpensive tripod. Or better yet, stand with a solid posture and consider holding the phone like shown here. The idea is to become a human tripod. First, hold the phone with a backhand grip and don't cover the camera. Pull your arm in and brace it against your body. You can also grab your elbow with the other hand for additional support. If you hold your phone like this, you can comfortably shoot steady video for a long time without getting tired. PowerPoint can capture computer video using the screen recording function that is found under the insert menu. This function will record what's happening on your computer and insert the video in the current slide. There is no limit how long these videos can be. The resulting captured videos can be saved out of PowerPoint as MP4 files. If your end goal is just to produce a demonstration video, you don't need to save the PowerPoint presentation. Now let's walk through the steps. After selecting the screen recording function, the first thing you need to do is select the recording area. This can be on any of your computer screens and can be any size, including full screen. You can see in this case, I'm selecting just a portion of the screen. There is an option to record audio. This will allow you to record narration while recording the computer screen. This works well. When you record the slideshow later on, you have the option of using this audio or not. You can also combine this audio with any narration you provide in the slideshow recording. Screen recording does not record the sounds produced by your computer except what the microphone picks up from the computer speakers, and it's not the best. If you do this, turn your computer sound volume all the way up. You also have the option of not recording the mouse pointer. Now you are ready to record. Select the record button. A counter will count down three, two, one, and then recording will start. The area you selected will be recorded until you press the square stop button. Time will count during the recording process. The time is displayed under the stop button. When you stop recording, the video will be inserted into the slide. You can move it, resize it, or apply many of the editing, animation, or layer functions that we've already discussed. This is a demonstration of full screen recording. An animation is used to make it appear. The barrel bob image makes an appearance using a timing and an animation. About anything is possible. Full screen video can be produced by resizing the screen recording to fill the entire slide. 
Usually the inserted videos will become part of the final slideshow recording. If all you need is the captured video, you can export it directly from the slide. Right click the video and select Save Media As. You will then be prompted for a location and a file name. The only export format available is MP4. You may want to use only a portion of a video or you may have dead airspace at the beginning or end and want to eliminate it. PowerPoint has a trim function. Right click the video and a context menu will appear containing an option to trim. In the window that appears, drag the green marker to trim the start and the red marker to trim the end. The underlying video is not changed, so you can always adjust. We use an animation to make the video play at the correct time. I'll discuss animations more in the next section, but for now, here's what you need to know for videos. When you place a video on a slide, either by importing it or by recording it, a start on click animation and trigger are automatically created in an animation pane. The bottom one in the list is the trigger. This trigger will start the video if you click on it with your mouse. It's not required. Leave it or remove it if you want by right clicking. The animation will start the video when you advance the slideshow, which means click the mouse, press enter, or various other ways. You will use this one. Animations have three different activation methods. Start on click, start with previous, and start after previous. The default is start on click, which means that it's activated by anything that advances the slideshow. There can be a list of animations that will start one after another in order, such as your bullet points. The start with previous means that an animation will start immediately after the previous animation starts with no delay. It won't wait for the previous animation to finish. The start after previous means that the animation will wait for the previous animation to finish before it starts. In this example, there is one animation. The choice we have is start the video after we advance the presentation, which would be start on click, or start the video automatically when the slide opens, which would be start with previous. More information on animations is provided in the next section. The PowerPoint presentation can become very large if you use video. The Compressed Media option under File will become available if you have video in your presentation and will decrease the size of your PowerPoint file. I don't recommend using this for most presentations because it permanently alters your embedded videos but can be useful in certain situations where you either need to reduce the file size or you want to permanently trim a video as shown later. It's best not to do this on the original presentation because you can't go back. Use a copy. Pick a compression level that matches your goals. The compression will start immediately after you select a compression level and it will report how much space was saved. The PowerPoint file on disk will not be updated until you save the presentation. Please note that this process will compress the video to the quality you specify and eliminate any trimmed footage. If you use the trim video function in your presentation, the actual video is unaltered. Let's say you have a 200 megabyte video and you only want to use five seconds of it. It would be nice just to insert the part you need and keep the file size small and also have the trim file for other uses. This can be accomplished using the following steps. Create a new blank PowerPoint work file that won't be saved. Insert the video to be trimmed on a slide. Drag the green and red tabs to trim the video down to five seconds that you want to keep. Compress the PowerPoint under the file menu at the quality you want. After the compression is finished, the video will contain only the five seconds you want to keep. Right click the video and choose Save Media As. The video file you save will contain only the part you want to keep. Close the PowerPoint and don't save the changes. You can use this video file in any application. In this case, the PowerPoint was just used as a tool to edit the video. If your recorded or imported video has sound, it can be used when you record the slideshow. You can adjust the video volume level or mute it here in the video control. Remember that you have the option to record narration or not when you record the slideshow. Between these two settings, you can provide narration from video, from the slideshow, from both, or provide no audio at all. There are a few video functions that I don't think PowerPoint can do. 
You'll need additional software like Camtasia to accomplish them, or better yet, ask someone to do it for you that already has video editing software and has some experience using it. You can trim videos in PowerPoint, but you can't combine them. Animations and timings can be used to create a similar effect using two videos if you want to go through the effort. Sometimes it's nice to speed up a section of video to show the passage of time and save the viewer from watching something tedious. PowerPoint can't do this. You'll need other video editing software. Rarely you might want to record the internal sound of the computer when running software when recording a slideshow. This does not work well. All you can do is crank the sound volume up and hope for the best. Sounds produced in PowerPoint will record well, even from embedded videos in PowerPoint. One option is to run an audio recording software while recording the slideshow. The recorded audio file of the computer sounds can then be added to the presentation after the fact in time to match the video. Animations can create movement for any object. A correctly placed animation can really enhance a presentation. Try to use the same animations for consistency in your presentation. I have already discussed animations, some in the beginning sections and in videos. I won't go into detail, but want to give a quick overview of some more of the animation features. But please take a class or watch some videos for more information. There are different types of animations, which I already discussed that include Entrance for making objects appear. Exit for removing objects. Emphasis, which makes items more visible. And motion paths, which move objects. All the objects you can place on a slide can have animations, including bullets and text, shapes, images, videos, and charts. Now I'm going to discuss animations and timings for a little bit. On the slide I have three uh, images, one representing on click, one representing uh, with previous and one representing after previous. And I would like to add an animation for the mouse icon. To do that I would select it, I would go up to add animation and then I would pick the animation I want. And I'm going to use an entrance animation and I'm going to use swivel. And it will be uh, added to my animation pane and if I right click uh, you can see that it's uh, set to start on click. Once this is uh, set up, I'm going to cover the timing options. Those are, that's the most important option I'd like to cover. There are a few effect options as well. But under timing, uh, you can set again uh, how it starts, and then this one is going to start on click. But you can also set a delay. So if you want to be able to click and then have a time delay until that uh, animation actually occurs, you can enter it there. The duration of the animation is set to be two seconds, which is medium, and it has some predefines, and you can type in an animation in these, and it's set to uh, not repeat. So I'm going to accept that, and then I can play that from here just to see what that looks like. So there, there it is. Back in the timing options, I could uh, say I wanted to repeat that two times, and once I did that, it'll preview it and it'll go through and it'll play that animation two times. One thing you'll notice to the right over here is a green bar, and that um, represents the length of time that the object will animate, and as you change options and timing, this bar here will change, and you can see I have two occurrences of it, and you can actually drag the uh, durations of these here or move the object and cause a delay. So you can graphically change these or you can right click and go to timing and change the values in here. Now I've added a few more of the mouse icons and uh, let's add some more on-click uh, events for animations. So let's do the other five. So I'm going to hold down the shift 
and select uh, the other five um, mouse images and I'll add those as animations by going back up to the add animation tool and let's use swivel again and they'll all be added and previewed and I added them all together so the first one by default got the uh, got the start on click mouse event but the rest of them ended up with the start with previous but I want to show them on click so let's go ahead and pick those I can select them one at a time or all and add start on click so as you see all of the mouse icons now are set to start on click and the first one still has the double uh, double animation I'm going to preview that by clicking uh, place selected which when I pick the top item it says play from so it's going to start at the first and play through quickly and you'll see that it's going to simulate mouse clicks to play these one at a time sequentially now I've changed things a little I have a uh, image at the top that uh, is a mouse that represents on click and then under it I have some rectangles that represent the with previous events and I've already added um, animations and the mouse icon is um, set to start on click and the rest of the rank rectangles are set to start with previous and uh, let's go ahead and preview that and you'll see that when the on click event happens and the mouse animates that all of the rectangles start with the beginning of the previous animation and all um, start at the exact same time um, I can adjust the timing on the first one and uh, I have no repeat set I'm going to go ahead and I'll set that to repeat four times so you'll see when this finishes previewing that this event is very long and that the other ones are much shorter but these with previous events will happen at the exact same time that the first mouse click event happens so let's preview that again okay I've changed it again now to demonstrate after previous so now uh, I have the mouse icon with four uh, repeats of the animation on click and then I have uh, four of the after previous image animations that are set to after previous so these will complete before the next animation occurs and you can see that in um, the animation pane over here where you see the four animations of the first one click uh, image and then you'll see each um, animation that happens sequentially after the previous and then at the end we have another with previous animation and as you can see the rectangle will animate when the previous uh, animation begins so let's preview that and this will continue till the very end until the next animation begins and then they will ha happen sequentially after the previous and then the last two happen at the same time one thing that is difficult about animations is the fact that when you create all the animations in the animation pane many of them are named with names that are difficult to know what they really are like picture four and picture six and there's several of these that are picture six I can click on them and when I click on them they will highlight but uh, in a complicated animation 
it gets really um, difficult to keep track, and especially when you're dragging these around and switching places with them to know what they are. Now, usually the bullets will uh, be named according to the bullet name um, that is in their text, so that's usually fairly easy to keep track of, but um, the image is not so much. Uh, one thing you can do to help that is to rename them, and it's not obvious how to rename them. There's no way to do it here in the animation pane. But if you go to the Home menu and go over to Select, there is a selection pane. And for example, um, the, the Barrel Bob uh, image here, if I select it, uh, it will highlight in the animation pane and in the selection pane, and it's called Image 32, and that doesn't make any sense. So I can double click in there and I can rename it, and that will help me out quite a bit as I'm working on my animations. That's about all you need to know about animations. Animations are very useful to display bullets and to play videos, but also can enhance the experience for the viewer if used properly. Have you ever gotten lost in your slides if your PowerPoint is large or tried to move a section around and just lose track of all your slides and have a big organizational mess? Well, sections are a great organizational tool. Here you'll see me select some slides and then right click to create a section and give it a name. You can organize slides of a related topic together. Slides in the section can be collapsed to reduce the length of the list, too. Whole sections can be moved, so reorganizing the slideshow becomes much easier. PowerPoint can create charts. You create a chart under the Insert menu. There are many chart types to choose from, and all the types can be animated. I chose the column chart, and it is created with some sample data, which I'll leave alone. Data is entered through a spreadsheet interface. The next slide contains the same chart, and I've added the bounce transition so it's easy to see there is an animation. The individual parts of a chart can also be animated. When you select the chart, an Effects Option button becomes available. The As One object is the default. In that mode, as we just saw, the entire chart is animated. The other options can animate different parts of the chart to selectively bring them in or to emphasize data. Here are some examples. Selecting the by series provides animation for the chart in each of the series. Here is a series demo animated with start on click. As with the other animations, all the options are customizable. The first mouse click brings in the chart using fade. The second and third click brings in series one and series two using fade. The third click brings in series three using bounce. This is the same demonstration, except this time by category. My element in series provides the most control. Every element can be animated and scripted individually. Animation options can be edited and animations can be removed. The only limitation I know is that the order of the animations cannot be changed. My element and category is the same as element and series, except the order is different. In all of these, the animations you don't want can be deleted. In this case, I'm only animating the last category. There are many different chart types, and for each one, there are several versions. Here's an example of a pie chart using an animation for emphasis.
Thanks for watching, and I hope you got some ideas for creating e-learning videos. Refer to the table of contents at the beginning of the video if you want to rewatch any of the topics.